Welcome back to the second half of uh, season 41. And let's move on to tonight's uh, topic, which in fact we have discussed before. And I do remember in the dim and distant past, uh, long before Brexit and long before a lot of other things, uh, we did have a member of the House of Lords come along and uh, he actually was also an academic. <clears throat> he was the, so they reckoned to be the expert on the constitution at the time. And I do remember what he had to say to us, which was, I thought a little bit complacent, which was essentially, uh, it works well as a reform, uh, revising chamber. It doesn't cost you very much. You get good value for money and it's working. So you ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, ever since then, uh, there have been from time to time grumbles uh, about uh, the way it works. Maybe as citizens, many of us are troubled by the sheer number of peers and the questionable appointments that we see, taking this as uh, an evidence of corruption or uh, influence peddling. Uh, but this meeting is a chance to look at such ideas and a great deal more. And so to guide us through it, we welcome Meg Russell, who is Professor of British and Comparative Politics at UCL. And of course, she's, as you know, she's Director of the Internationally Recognised Constitution Unit there, which was founded in 1995. Now, I reckon she's a great communicator with a, a precision in her analysis that I think you will appreciate on a tricky subject like this. I looked it up and her unit's published aims are research into constitutional change and the reform of political institutions. And when I try to unpack that, uh, this opened up a lot more issues. And if Wiki is to be believed, uh, it includes looking at elections, referenda, monarchy and the church, devolution, the legal system, and a great deal more. Meg, as it happens, is also an expert on constitutions around the world. She may not be able to speak about uh, uh, nearly 200 uh, different countries, but I think she knows about the main ones. Uh, and since she's often in demand uh, to sit on bodies tasked with the review of their institutions and to recommend change. So if you're wondering whether other countries do it better than us, uh, I'm sure she'll be very happy to talk to you about that, either in the lecture or in Q&A that follows. So just take the opportunity to broaden out the Q&A session into any of these areas, as I've no doubt that Meg will uh, uh, welcome uh, a wide range and stimulating discussion with you. So that's enough from me. Meg, it's del delighted to see you. I've been keen for you to come to World Affairs for quite a few years, and it's it's wonderful to have you with us tonight. And also, I'd, I'd add that uh, Lord Peter Hennessy, our president, and I spoke to him earlier this week, and uh, he expressed equal enthusiasm and delight that, that you're with us. So uh, uh, thank you for coming, so to speak, uh, onto our screen. And uh, it's uh, this subject is never quite out of the news. Uh, the pandemic has pushed a lot of things out of the way, but uh, the Constitution and the Lords keeps coming up. So we're really looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for that generous introduction, Bill, and thank you for inviting me to speak. And I very much look forward to not only opportunity to talk to you, uh, but also to listen to and answer your questions. And um, I've got a warning there. I hope you're not going to consider me complacent, um, but we shall see. And if you do, prod me in the questions. Now, I've got some slides which I hope are going to be shared. There we go. That's great. So there's my title. How should the House of Lords be reformed? I'm going to structure my talk um, in around four different um, sections. I will start with a quick whistle-stop tour around um, what the House of Lords is, because I don't think we should talk about reforming it until we've got some idea what it is, but I'll rattle through that very quickly. Then I move on to the question, which is a deliberately ambitious question, how should the House of Lords be reformed? I think there are three ways that we could interpret it. How in terms of reformed to what? How in terms of reform through what process? And how in terms of how we can actually make reform happen? And I suggest that we spend rather too much time thinking about the first of those, but the second one, and in particular the third one, are very, very important. But let me start with what the House of Lords is. 
Now, you're a highly educated and sophisticated audience. So if I show you this picture, I'm sure you will immediately see the fault. Uh, that is not what the House of Lords looks like. You see that picture associated with it very often. Um, but why is it wrong? Well, the clue is this little blue woman here. That is the House of Lords on the day of the state opening of Parliament. That's the Queen delivering her speech. They're dressed in their ermine trimmed robes. They wear those once a year. This is what the House of Lords really looks like most days. Um, men and women in ordinary working clothes, yes, in an elaborate gilded chamber, um, but acting as a very professional uh, legislative body. How is the House of Lords made up? I'm sure that you know these basics, but just to remind you, because it's clearly very relevant to reform, um, basically three main types of members of the Lords. Um, in some ways, the best well-known are the hereditary peers. They used to dominate the chamber, but since a reform in 1999, there are just 92 of them left. They are um, renewed through a rather controversial mechanism of by-elections, most of them, where there's an electorate made up of hereditary peers. This is a very strange aspect of our constitution, which I'm happy to come back to later. Then you have the 26 Church of England bishops and archbishops who are appointed by the church on the basis of their seniority. We can come back and talk about that a bit more too if you like later. I'm not really going to focus much on that. My primary interest is the largest group in the Lords, who are the life peers. There's not a fixed number of them. There are currently over 650. Um, all life peers are appointed by the monarch officially, but on the recommendation of the prime minister. And within the, the life peer group, there are two main groups, really. The majority are appointed to represent political parties chosen by party leaders, but filtered by the prime minister. And then there's a relatively large group of non-party crossbenchers who are mostly chosen by an independent appointments commission. If you look at the makeup by group, party and other groups in the chamber, this is what the House of Lords looks like. So the blue is the Conservatives, the red is Labour, the grey is the crossbenchers, yellow Liberal Democrats, and then the others in purple. What do we see here? Uh, well, the first thing to note is that the government, the, uh, the blue group, has no overall majority in the chamber. It could easily, in principle, be outvoted by the other groups all ganging up together, if they all voted. But of course, another key thing about the House of Lords is that they, they don't all vote. Turnout uh, in 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 attendance in general and voting in particular um, is much more patchy than it is in the House of Commons. And the crossbench group do not all vote the same way. They are independent of political party. They operate as individuals. They make up their mind on a case by case basis, which way to go. So if you look at the Conservatives, their opponents most of the time will be Labour in red and the Liberal Democrats in green. And there you've got relative parity between the two. So the other groups are often the deciding factor in whether the government wins or loses a vote. That's who they are. What do they do? Well, very much in a nutshell, and I'm sure that most of you are familiar with some of this as well. Um, I always say to my students, I always ask my students, what's the key difference um, in powers between the House of Commons and the House of Lords? And they almost invariably don't pick the thing that I think is the most important answer. That is that in the House of Commons, the government requires um, the, the, the government requires the confidence of the House of Commons in order to remain in office. A vote of no confidence will remove the government from office. There's no such expectation in the House of Lords. Indeed, that's sort of a wild suggestion, which is why my students never come up with it. This is a sort of this is baked in. We, we don't even think about there being a confidence vote in the House of Lords. That is a really key difference between the powers of the two chambers. Beyond that, the thing that my students normally mention um, is that the Lords has less power over legislation than the House of Commons. So um, the House of Commons um, uh, support is required for a bill to become law. It's not on most bills absolutely required that the Lords um, signs up. Um, most of the time it has a delay power rather than an absolute veto. 
In terms of what it does, day to day, it spends a great deal of its time on legislation, scrutinizing it in detail. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. It also does the various other things that are familiar from the House of Commons. So it questions ministers uh, through daily question times. It holds them generally to account um, through uh, debates. I say there that um, the, question, the, the ministers that it's, that it's holding to account are generally more junior ones. Most cabinet ministers, as I'm sure you all know, sit in the House of Commons. But every government department has a Lord's Minister who has to answer in the chamber. And then it has a system of specialist select committees. Again, like the House of Commons, but very different because in the House of Commons, they are structured according to government departments. In the House of Lords, they are cross-cutting, most of them. So for examples on the slide, science and technology, uh, the Constitution Committee, committees looking at delegated legislation, peopled with often real experts. Let me say a bit more about legislation briefly. This is the thing that the Lord spends a great deal of its time on. Um, it makes thousands of amendments every year to government bills. Um, so here's an example session. It's a few years ago now. There's no particular reason to think that these figures would have changed. Over 6,000 amendments proposed in the Lords, of which nearly 2,000 are agreed. That is a lot of legislative work. But it's important to point out that most of the amendments agreed in the Lords are proposed by government ministers. So out of those um, 1,800 amendments, over 1,700 of them in that session were proposed by ministers. So that makes it look like maybe the government is dominant in the Lords. But actually, if you look closely, which I've done with some of my research, you find that most of the time when the government is proposing amendments in the Lords, it's because they've been pressurized to do so by members. They're often proposing amendments which follow up on proposals that have come from non-government members of the House of Lords, either members of their own backbenches or the crossbenchers or the opposition parties. And one of the interesting facts which is often little appreciated is that bills tend to start in the Commons and move to the Lords, and then they often get quite heavily amended in the Lords, but that doesn't just that doesn't mean in itself that the Lords is the place that the government listens to most. Because often what the Lords is doing is following up on complaints and concerns that are raised on legislation when the bill is in the Commons. And there's actually a lot of behind the scenes communication between the chambers. The aspect of legislation which we most often hear about is the government being defeated in the Lords. And indeed, uh, this week we had a pretty extraordinary day when the government was defeated 14 times in one day. That was the largest number of defeats in a day in over 20 years. Normally, defeats are, well, the defeats are rarely, if ever, on the principle of bills. Because of the primacy of the elected House of Commons, generally the, the House of Lords doesn't vote on the second and third reading of bills. That is the bill, the whole bill in principle. What it does is vote a lot on proposed amendments and their government defeats are very common. So here's a picture of government defeats per session over the last long, long time, back, going back till 1975, every session going back until 1975. So you see that there's quite a sort of pattern of up and down. Some, some sessions, there are a lot of defeats. You've got in the, in the beginning there over 120. To understand this pattern, think about who was in government at the time. So over this whole period, this is when the Conservatives are in government from 1979 to 1997, and the number of defeats is very low. That's because the House of Lords, until its reform uh, under the Blair government, was a very conservative dominated institution. So it tended to defeat Labour governments more than Conservative governments. You then get a reform in 1999. And what do you see when the Conservatives come back into power? Actually, rather more defeats going on. And particularly in this period post 2015, because of course, from 2010 to 2015, uh, the Conservatives were in coalition with the Liberal Democrats, and consequently, they were quite strong in the House of Lords. So this has very much changed, this is part of the kind of background that has very much changed the relationship between the Conservatives or the political parties in general, really, and the House of Lords. 
um, over the last sort of 20, 25 years. It has become a chamber which challenges the Conservatives much more than it used to do. In terms of what happens to those defeats, in theory, they could all be overturned, pretty much all be overturned by the House of Commons. The House of Commons could simply seek to ignore the House of Lords. But that isn't what actually happens. Again, my research has followed um, the trajectory of Lords' defeats and sought to, to see how often they're overturned and how often there is compromise or they are accepted. And about half of the time over the period that I studied, they do go on to be accepted. So the Lords is influential. Just a word about the consequences of the way that the Lords is composed and the powers that it has, just to give a bit more flavour before I begin to move on to talk about reform. In some ways, as you can imagine, the House of Lords is a rather less challenging chamber for the government uh, than the House of Commons because of the lack of the confidence vote. The government can't fall thanks to no confidence in the Lords. And the Lords normally respect the primacy of the elected House of Commons. So in the case of dispute, they tend to back down. Debate in the chamber um, tends to be less partisan and more reasoned. Because the government doesn't have a majority, it can't just rely on partisan arguments to win, to win the vote. It has to actually make the case. In the, in, in the Lords, because of the uh, primacy of the Commons, the focus is often on the detail rather than the big political questions. And all of this in some ways actually makes it a more challenging chamber for the government because of this need to win by, win by reason, not sloganizing. It can't just rely on its party numbers. And the audience in the House of Lords is very diverse, not just in partisan terms, but in terms of expertise. So it's well known that there are a lot of very um, eminent people in the Lords on all benches, particularly the cross benches, who are there to hold the government to account. This is challenging for ministers. So beginning to move towards reform, we all know, I think, that the House of Lords is a controversial institution. Here are just some front pages. So there's the... Uh, You'll recognize that picture. That's the same one I showed you earlier, classically used in the newspapers to represent the Lords, but actually not very representative of what it does. There's the Daily Mirror calling for the Lords to be swept away. Here's the Daily Mail referring to them as a house of unelected wreckers, um, branded a cozy cabal for Remain during the Brexit debates. Here again is a reference in the mail to the ermine, uh, which of course they don't normally wear, um, people think that the Lords is outdated, outsized, and out of touch. Here's the Sunday Times doing a big feature on the hereditary peers, uh, one of the mo most often questioned elements of the Lords. And here's another frequently questioned element in the Sunday Times um, only a few months ago, questioning whether there's a cash for peerages uh, scandal with people buying their seats in the chamber. So there are lots of controversial, lots of controversies surrounding the place. It's important to note before talking about the UK and its prospects that we're actually not alone in having a controversial second chamber. In fact, my comparative work points out that second chambers around the world everywhere have a controversial purpose they exist to question the decisions of the first chamber of parliament and the government. This, op this often makes them unpopular, particularly with the government and its supporters. In terms of composition, it's not only the Lords which is controversial. In countries which have elected second chambers, uh, where the chamber can be seen as too similar to the first chamber, the second chamber is often criticized for being sort of surplus to requirements. But then again, when they're too different, including when they're not elected, their democratic legitimacy is brought into question. So all around the world, not in every single country, but it's very common for there to be calls for reform in countries that have two chamber parliaments. So that brings me to my core question. How should the House of Lords be reformed? And I told you I'm going to break this into three kinds of how. My first kind of how should it be reformed is reformed to what? 
Now, this, I think, is what most people think about when they're asked, if you were asked, how should the House of Lords be reformed, you'd probably answer with what it should be like. We don't talk very much about reform of the powers of the Lords. That tends not to be terribly controversial. We talk about its composition. And here are some of the possible answers you could give to the question reform to what. You might hear arguments that the Lords should be abolished, like the Daily Mirror suggested there. You might hear suggestions that it should be a wholly elected chamber. Specifically, you might hear suggestions that it should be a chamber of the nation and regions to reflect devolution in some way. There have been suggestions that it should be mixed, made up of elected and appointed members together. And then there are suggestions for more minor changes to the status quo, which I'm gonna say more about a little later. All of these things you hear but with different levels of frequency. So actually abolition in terms of serious proposals for reform, when people have looked at the question in detail, is not very often proposed. If you look around the world, uh, countries that have two chambers tend to be the larger, more diverse countries. Britain is a large country in population terms and it is very diverse. So, unicameral, one, one chamber parliaments, tend to be smaller and sort of more cohesive. It would be a strange move, I think, and most people agree, to remove our second chamber completely. It does do an important job of holding the government to account. So what about making it wholly elected? This is much more often called for. Um, there are, if you, if you look around the world, there are, um, I think the current number is 84, uh, second chambers, 84 two-chamber parliaments. I got another question that I asked my students, I asked them just last week, how many of those do you think are all elected? Well, we know about the American Senate, for example. You know, we might think we're totally out of step, but it is actually only about half the second chambers around the world that are entirely elected, which is quite interesting. When it's debated in, in the UK, and I may say about, a bit more about this in a moment, um, the kinds of questions which are raised about introducing an all-elected chamber are what would happen to the crossbenchers? How would we get the independent members and the, the kind of senior experts that we value in the House of Lords in an all-elected chamber? And one of the big concerns, particularly coming from MPs, is that there, there would be a level of uh, competition uh, between the two chambers with competing claims for democratic legitimacy and that the House of Lords might become de facto more powerful, challenge the Commons more often. So those are the kind of things to weigh up with respect to election. We've heard quite a lot of proposals that the House of Lords should change into a chamber of the nations and regions. This is also quite well informed by international experience. So there are lots of different examples around the world of second chambers which reflect the territorial structure of the country. The one which is often cited is Germany, where the Bundesrat represents the governments of the different states. The, of course, the American Senate is also a classic example of territorial representation. The Australian Senate is another well-known example. The South African Senate, there are lots of them. So could we do this? Well, it's a good idea in principle, but the asymmetric nature of our devolution settlement makes this very challenging. So we've got a, we've got a parliament in Scotland and in Wales and an assembly in Northern Ireland, but who would represent England? And then even if you could work that out, would it be the voters represented? Would it be the parliaments represented? Or would it be the governments represented in the second chamber? There are some real kind of design choices there. Finally, um, we've often heard suggestions that there should be a mixture of elected and appointed members in the second chamber. And I'll, I'll have more of that on a subsequent slide because there have been lots of proposals for that. This could be a way perhaps of sort of getting the best of both worlds. The, the, democratic legitimacy that comes with election, but the expertise and independence that can come with appointments. And then finally, I'll say more about um, smaller reforms uh, in a moment. So that's the what could it be? But my next question is how, in terms of what sort of process should we go through to reform it? And I'm gonna contrast two things here. 
The target, when we think about where we want to get with Lord's reform, is often the idea that we should have a kind of big bang wholesale reform. Obviously, a move to an all-elected house would require that, for example. How has that gone historically? Well, the, the first real big bang reform was proposed by Harold Wilson's Labour government back in the 1960s. They proposed a major package in a, in a piece of legislation which would have changed the powers of the chamber as well as fundamentally changing its composition. Despite having the full backing of the government in principle, this got completely bogged down in the House of Commons with lots of arguments about the detail, lots of delay in committee, and eventually the government dropped the bill. The next kind of big bang reform um, pressure came during the Labour government of Tony Blair and then going into Gordon Brown's period. So we had the 1999 reform, which got rid of the hereditary peers, um, but then there was a desire to go further. So there was a Royal Commission, which reported um, in 2000, that was followed up by a government white paper. Both of those proposed that we should move to a partly elected house, but where only a minority of the members were elected and a majority were appointed. This was widely uh, criticized, uh, including by the government's own MPs for being too timid, for not introducing enough democracy to the chamber. After that had been withdrawn, there was a famously uh, rather a disastrous set of votes in the House of Commons in 2003 when a whole set of proposals were put before MPs, everything from all appointed to all elected and even abolition with largely appointed, largely elected, etc. Everything was voted down. The government then came back in 2007 with a white paper proposing a compromise, a half elected, half appointed house. This proved to please nobody. And eventually it moved to essentially the opposite set of proposals to what it had come up with uh, at the beginning of that decade, proposing a largely elected chamber, part appointed. But the government never put that into effect. You could say it had run out of time, perhaps, but it did have two more years that it could have done it. Then along comes the coalition government and Lord's reform is a very big priority for the Liberal Democrats in that government. Uh, Nick Clegg led, uh, led uh, on a bill to introduce an 80% or wholly elected chamber. There was a rebellion on the conservative benches at the bill's second reading and that bill was also withdrawn. Interestingly, Labour opposed that bill, notwithstanding the fact that the proposals were suspiciously similar to the ones that had been put in 2008, which is a nice illustration that the parties are very good at talking about reform, but they're much less good at implementing it. In particular, they're much less good at reaching agreement. There's often a lot of internal disagreement. So that's big bang reform. The alternative in terms of this how is small scale reform, incremental reform. And I would suggest that this has been much more uh, successful historically. So just to run you through quickly reforms that have happened to the House of Lords. In 1911, the Liberal government had a short, simple reform to remove the House of Lords veto power and reduce it to a power of delay. This was pretty uncontroversial in as much as it had long been called for. And it was small and simple. Famously, the preamble to the 1911 Act uh, referred to larger scale reform, suggesting that there was support for a chamber constituted on a popular instead of a hereditary basis, but that this could not be immediately brought into operation. So there was an acknowledgement that this was a small incremental change and bigger reform was to follow. Then in the 1940s, the Labour government, which also arrived with an idea to wholesale reform the Lords, introduced another small incremental reform, which simply reduced the delay power of the Lords from two years to one, again pending larger scale reform. In 1958, the Conservatives introduced the Life Peerages Act. At that time, the only way into the House of Lords the primary way into the House of Lords was by either uh, inheriting your seat or by being appointed as a hereditary peer. This was increasingly outdated and the Conservative government introduced the notion of life peerages. So you could be appointed 
uh, only for your own lifetime. This again was seen as a, a stopgap reform until further reform could be achieved. Then you had Labour's Act in 1999, which removed all but 92 of the hereditary peers, as I've referred to. This was followed by the Royal Commission and all of the other things that I've just mentioned. These words here are from, the, from Labour's 1997 General Election Manifesto, that the, that the hereditary peers would be removed as an initial self-contained reform, the first stage of a process of reform to make the House of Lords more democratic and representative. And we're still waiting for that second stage. So what we see here is that each of these reforms at the time was seen as small and somewhat inadequate. But in retrospect, each of them is very important, actually. And collectively, they've amounted to a transformation of the House of Lords. I mentioned their unintended consequences because the 1999 Act in particular swept away the hereditary peers who were predominantly conservative. The Labour government, I think, expected that this would give them an easier life. And in fact, it made the House of Lords more confident to challenge the government. And you saw that the number of defeats, for example, went up considerably. So incremental reform works. In that case, what is the most urgent little reform that we need now? The most burning problem, I suggest, is the uncontrolled size of the House of Lords. Bill referred to this in his opening remarks. The, the Prime Minister recommends appointments to the Queen, and there is no limit on the, either the size of the chamber or the number of appointments that he can make at any time. Here's what's happened to the size of the chamber since the 1999 reform. You see that it has crept up inexorably from just over 650 to over 800. Um, you see, if you look at the, the years on the, on the x-axis there, you see that it was creeping up gradually over the Labour years by about 50. And then when uh, David Cameron took over as Prime Minister in 2010, you get a really sharp increase by another 100 or so over about six years, dropping down a little bit, um, including under Theresa May, and then beginning to rise again under Boris Johnson. This creates a very inefficient chamber um, where they're vying for time to speak and so on. Um, it is now by, by far the largest second chamber in the world, and this often brings it into ridicule in our media in particular. As well as the un unregulated size, what goes with that is the unregulated party balance. So the, that's, the, um, that's the balance of um, parties in the, in the Lords with the red being Labour and the blue being the Conservatives, the yellow being the Liberal Democrats again. The 1999 reform brought the parties more or less into balance and Labour gradually gained uh, gained seats and to, to what became the largest party after it had been in government for about nine years. You then see that the Conservatives, after they came back into power, increased sharply. And they're getting stronger and stronger in the House of Lords. So they've now got nearly 100 peers more than Labour. The effect of this over time, and it's always been the case, is this kind of dangerous ratchet effect on the size of the chamber. Because if you think about what would happen if Labour came into power now, what, would, what might they feel they needed to do? They might want to overtake the Conservatives, but to do so, they'd have to appoint over 100 peers. We'd be up to 900. So this is a very controversial matter. And this is where a lot of recent reform attempts have focused. So the House of Lords itself has been trying to act on this. Um, back in 2016, the former Lord Speaker, Norman Fowler, created a committee to look at the size of the House and make recommendations. It reported in 2017. It proposed that there should be a cap on the size of the House of 600, that there should be a requirement for, for future appointments to be balanced between the parties, and that until the chamber reached the cap of 600, there should be a principle operating of only one new peer in for every two who left. How's this been going? Well, you've seen the slide with the, with the lines. Um, Theresa May seemingly accepted the principles of this report. She was pretty modest in the appointments that she made. But following Boris Johnson's appointment as prime minister, 
Um, the committee's first progress report um, on him last May pointed out that he has undone much of the progress made in the past few years by the House and the previous Prime Minister. So it's taken the, the wrong direction, the upward trajectory again. At the same time, and I'm going to have to speed up and finish because uh, Bill's going to start getting angry with me, um, there is another uh, set of proposals going uh, to end the hereditary peer by-elections. This has been proposed over and over again in private members' bills in the Lords, most recently by Labour's Lord Grocott, but these constantly get blocked and they never win the support of the government. In practice, removing the hereditary peers or ending the by-elections would definitely need legislation. And in practice, when you look at the behavior of Boris Johnson as prime minister, the cap on uh, the number of peers and the number of appointments probably also now needs legislation because depending on good behavior just isn't getting us very far. But in practice, in order to achieve legislation, you need government support. So that takes me to my third question. How can reform be made to happen? I suggest that this is very difficult. There are various obstacles to small scale reform and I'll try and be quick here. Firstly, it's never really a high electoral priority for the public. It's low salience um, and who's gonna get excited about a little tweak to the House of Lords? There's no real electoral pressure. Within the parties, they may fear looking unambitious. It's not very radical to reform the House of Lords in a small way. You could get accused um, of being a kind of status quo supporter um, rather than the kind of radicals that politicians like to appear to be. This is one of the biggest conundrums, I think, that those who agitate for reform of the House of Lords tend to focus on the big reforms and they have a degree of fear that if small reforms happen, that's going to make the House of Lords look more legitimate. It's going to weaken the case for, small, for big reform. So they tend to actually oppose small reform. And then governments, of course, are never very much in favour of strengthening the Lords and making it more legitimate because it make, a strong House of Lords makes their life difficult. Indeed, I would suggest perhaps they even have the reverse uh, motivation. So this is a piece that I wrote back in 2015 about David Cameron. It had a rather provocative title. Is he actually seeking to destroy the Lords by making so many appointments? The news was full of headlines about how the House of Lords was big and bloated and ridiculous. And I was beginning to have a suspicion that the Prime Minister might even be doing this on purpose in order to reduce the extent of pressure that he got from the House of Lords and the degree of opposition to his legislation. Maybe that was just a sort of crazy howl in the dark, but actually in, more, in subsequent years, we've begun to see these kind, of, um, these kind of fears expressed by others. So here's the Express complaining about the bloated House of Lords under uh, Boris Johnson. And this is a piece, again, in the Sunday Times, asking exactly the same question that I was asking about David Cameron, with citing a lot of peers in support who actually are beginning to think this, that the government is deliberately seeking to undermine the legitimacy of the second chamber in order to weaken it in opposition to itself. So this is my final slide. Reform. How, how, how? In terms of my three hows, for, uh, for the first one, the long-term destination of the House of Lords is probably going to continue to be disputed and debated for a long time. There are many viable options here worthy of debate, but we're not going to get there quickly. In practice, large-scale reform has never succeeded, but small-scale incremental reforms do sometimes succeed and can actually be crucial to maintaining, strengthening the chamber, and when you add them all together over a long period, effective transformation. The third how is by far the most difficult. How to actually make these happen when the government is almost constantly disinterested and perhaps even opposed 
to improving the House of Lords. I suggest that there is a fundamental anachronism at the heart of our constitution, that the government controls the membership, the size and the partisan composition of a legislative body which exists to hold it to account. There's virtually no regulation of appointments and the government can actually actively undermine the House of Lords as a consequence. This, I suggest, is a, a, a very important and underappreciated weakness in our system, and it's standing in the way of the very reform that we need. I've spoken for more than enough time. Thank you very much for your attention. Here's just a reminder of where you can find out more about the Constitution Unit, and that is my book on the Lords, the most recent one, but even the most recent one, I'm afraid, is now nine years old. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I've been poring over your questions and I look forward to seeing Meg alongside me before we, uh, here she is. Welcome back, Meg. Uh, right, well, we've got uh, quite a variety of questions and I'll try to do justice to them. And I, I'm gonna start with the, uh, the low hanging fruit, if you like. And this one from Jane Byrne. Many people now have no religion or religion other than Christianity or a denomination other than the Church of England. So why do the Church of England bishops continue to have political power? Maybe you could explore that for us. <laughs> um, well, that's interesting because the bishops were the one bit which I didn't really focus on with respect to reform. I guess um, maybe two bits of that question. Um, well, one, one, one interpretation would be, do they have political power? How much power do they have via the House of Lords? I would say a few things about how the bishops operate. Um, well, firstly, you know, I'm not here to defend them or denounce them, but just, just let me give you some facts. Um, although there are 26 of them in membership, there are normally only one, sort of one to three there on any one day. They have a bishop on duty. If you look at uh, the votes in the House of Lords, there are very few votes cast by the bishops. They don't cast a block vote of 26, interestingly. They tend to uh, vote independently of each other. Um, and the way that they organize, um, they do try to represent people of all faiths. Um, so they actually have a system of um, consultation uh, with other faith leaders and faith groups and take soundings from them and try to reflect um, their views as well in the contributions that they make to the Lords. Now, that's not me defending them. That's just me telling you some of the things about, you know, what, the, what they contribute. In terms of why they're still there, well, I think I'd probably refer you to my previous uh, uh, comments that reform is very difficult. Um, and in those different packages of reform, there have been different proposals for the bishop, but the big package is not through. Um, and I suppose in terms of small packages, um, most of the small packages don't get through either, but there isn't really a sort of burning argument given how little in practice difference they make to the outcome of things in the Lords for them to be the highest priority to, to be reformed, I guess I would say. Um, if people want them to be removed, they need to campaign for them to be removed. But I would suggest that there are higher priorities. Yes, but if I could come back on that, we are a multiracial society, and I suppose they sort of stand out like a sore thumb. I mean, if it said it was a, a, a religious, you had a sort of a religious category in the House of Lords in order to, that the, so that moral argument uh, mm. could be well represented. I mean, it wouldn't be, I know we do have uh, uh, quite a number of uh, uh, ethnic minority uh, peers in the Lords, mm. But uh, I, I'm not aware that any of them are appointed because of their uh, religious capacity. So has anyone thought that we should sort of perhaps trim back the Church of England and get the other, let the other faiths each have a representative, quite separately from the idea of whether Lord Patel should be in the House of Lords on his uh, merits as a secular citizen? Yes, yes. Well, I think there are two questions there, the trimming back um and the other faiths and yes on the trimming back there definitely have been proposals you would be testing my memory to say what did the 
what did the Royal Commission say in 2000, which is 22 years ago? I cannot honestly remember. I'd have to go and look that up. Um, the Lord Speaker's Committee on the Size of the House, I think, suggested that they should be trimmed back to 16, if I remember right. Mm. Um, so those kind of proposals have been made. Um, in terms of representation of other faiths, lots of people have looked at this, not, not so much in recent years, but there have been lots of different kind of investigations and suggestions. One of the difficulty is that not all faiths would accept seats in the House of Lords. Uh, the Catholics wouldn't, I believe. I think that's against their doctrine um, to sort of seek political representation. That's what I've been told anyway. And then the really complicated question is what should the proportions be? Um, you know, what, what, how many Muslims compared to Jews, compared to Sikhs, compared to Hindus, compared to Church of England people right. should there be? Um, and, you know, this is an imponderable question. And how many atheists should there be? Um, so people tend to go round and round in circles on these questions. But you're right that there have been some efforts through the standard appointments process, particularly to the cross benches, to represent other people of faith. So um, there's been more than one chief rabbi appointed to the Lords. Uh, there have been representatives of the Sikh community, but they are sitting there as individuals on their own merits rather than as representatives as such of their religious groupings. Okay, thanks. So uh, on a broader issue, uh, Ken Morse uh, quotes a 2018 uh, survey by YouGov, and he's, I don't know where our members get these quotes from, but uh, they, 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 here they are. And he quotes Anthony Wells, who's the, who was the Director of Political and Social Research, who wrote, the public are largely apathetic about the upper house, but what views they have tend to be negative. So Ken's question is whether the public perception of their role, uh, whether 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 that is of any importance to the Lords, and and uh, one might wonder whether they've got a, any sort of PR efforts behind them to try to make them seem more relevant uh, and more valuable. Uh, mm. do, do you have any comments on sort of yeah you know, how good a job they do of uh, putting across their value to society? Well, I think they do their best. And yes, they do have, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a fairly small operation, but they do have, um, they do have a public relations arm. But I would say that they are kind of the victims of their circumstances quite a lot. So the public, I mean, I've done some polling on the Lords, um, but the public don't don't know a great deal about the place in detail uh, and they don't have particularly well-formed views in general but they're obviously going to be influenced by those kind of headlines that i was showing you when the lords gets into the media it's often for some kind of claim of impropriety or just complaint about it being oversized etc it will often get into the news because it's challenged the government as it did this week on the police bill for example so those defeats on the police bill will no doubt have made the lords i mean i saw people on twitter for example commenting on this it's made the lords new friends among those people who are opposed to the police bill but it's undoubtedly also made the lords new enemies among people who think that the government should have got its way on that bill so it's complicated. It's often on the basis of, you know, where you sit policy wise. I did a I did an analysis, actually, of um, media coverage of the Lords a few years ago and found that it under under Blair, it was making friends in the liberal media uh, because it was challenging Blair on some of his more illiberal measures. And at, the, at that time, it had friends in the conservative media uh, because, you know, that was it conventionally, it had greater support on the conservative side because it was a more conservative institution and it was challenging Labour. But then that changed when it started challenging conservative governments. And it's had some quite vicious coverage uh, from the more conservative leaning media in recent years. And that, of course, is going to inform uh, public views. Um, I think it does care a great deal about its image and it worries a great deal about its image. And um, initiatives like the Lord Speaker's, at the establishment of the Lord Speaker's committee on the size of the house, it's not only driven by a kind of pure proof that there should be greater control over appointments, et cetera, et cetera. It's also driven by how it can see that it gets a bad media as a result of those uncontrolled appointments. And it has really been trying to push 
in the direction of reform that will keep its own size under control and that will put some greater limits on the prime minister's appointments powers. But, you know, as I've indicated, it has been failing. Um, and it's quite difficult when it's, it's, its whole kind of shape and membership lies so much in the hands of the government um, for it to ultimately do a great deal about its image, if that makes sense. Sure. Uh, moving on, Chris Barton, who's uh, an academic, is a professor in this region. Uh, he's, I think he's being a little bit uh, cheeky here, but he's a bit tongue-in-cheek. But he says, well, why do we want a two-chamber, oops, um, bicameral system anyway? Doesn't it just broaden and deepen the trough? Question mark. I suppose he's wondering whether, you know, more noses in the trough. I wonder if that's what he's saying. And he says, let's go the whole hog. So that's where he's trying to uh, play games. Um, and he says, why not have a tricameral system? I thought he was going to say, uh, you know, a, a unicameral system. But yeah. are there, could you talk to us just a little bit about uh, the alternatives? Since we've got all, we can't work out what we really want and how to mm. get there. Uh, are there other systems that work quite well with either one chamber or three chambers? Hmm. Well, as I said in the talk, um, larger democracies with sort of more complex societies, I mean, it is a, it's a bit of a generalization. It's not, it's not universally true. But there is a greater tendency to bicameralism in those systems. And there is also a greater tendency to bicameralism in the kind of families of democracies that we might consider ourselves to be part of. So the, the Commonwealth, you know, Canada, um, Australia, um, Ireland, um, various and small Commonwealth states as well. Some of, you know, some of the Caribbean states and so on, and India are all bicameral. And also um, bicameralism is very common in Western Europe, particularly among the larger states. So if we look at our closest and perhaps most similar neighbors in Europe, uh, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, these are all bicameral countries. Um, so that's not in itself a good enough reason to do it, but I think that in large complex societies, you know, policy making is very complex. And there are many different interests in society that deserve to be heard in the policy making process. And that's one of the things that bicameralism brings. It gives you an opportunity to perhaps hear different voices. And even if you're not hearing different, different voices, even if you're hearing some of the same voices as you do in the first chamber, the thing which it absolutely does is it slows down and complicates the policy making process. Now that might be seen as a bad thing by some people or sometimes, but generally if you're, making if you're making policy for a large and complex society, it's as well to think about it quite carefully. Um, and part of one sort of possible riposte to why don't we get rid of the House of Lords or you know, get rid of a second chamber completely um, is, well, do we think that the House of Commons does a perfect job? And would we get better decision making if it was the House of Commons on its own that was making the decisions? And I think that a lot of people, when they thought about that, would think that the answer was no. And that therefore, at the very least, if we got rid of the House of Lords, we'd have to reform the House of Commons quite a lot. Now, we do have, bicam we do have unicameral legislatures in the UK. Um, the Scottish Parliament, uh, the, the Welsh Senate and, uh, and the Northern Ireland Assembly are all unicameral. Um, and when they were set up, they were set up very deliberately with um, systems of stronger committees, for example, to try and hold the executive more to account. But they are also much smaller places and they're making a narrower, they, they, you know, they have responsibility for a narrow range of policy. So in general, I think, you know, second chambers mean second thought. And if you are interested in evidence-based policymaking and well-informed policymaking, there, is there are actually benefits in slowing the process down. What often happens, as I said, is um, issues are raised in the House of Lords, um, which have been raised as concerns in the House of Commons, but there hasn't been time to deal with them in the House of Commons. So the delay involved in moving from one chamber to another and the fact that you have multiple stages of the legislative process at which people can raise points 
gives time for the problems in legislation to be ironed out during that process. And if we curtailed and sped up the legislative process, we probably would end up with less well-considered law. I think that's actually the, um, the conclusion that the Labour government came to in the 1940s. I said that when Labour brought in the 1949 Parliament Act, it was thinking of bigger reform. It was actually at that time um, rather sort of rethinking its position because Labour had been in favour of abolition in the, in the early part of the 20th century. It officially still had a policy in favour of abolition. But Labour ministers, when they came in in the landslide 1945 government and they were trying to put through lots of legislation, actually began to recognise that even the extremely, at that time, conservative-dominated House of Lords had a useful legislative function. And they began to think twice about whether abolition was the right idea. And, and so, you know, that might be a bit of a clue as to why bicameralism is useful. Long answer, sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm afraid I've got a long question coming up. But I, but I would like to stay with the, to this historical uh, view of reform, what, what people have tried in the past. Uh, are you familiar, I imagine you are, with the 2012 uh, plan uh, from Lord David Steele uh, for the House of Lords reform? Because someone's, someone in our membership is sort of really going to turn with this question here. Mm -hmm. uh, let us know if it, you, you, don't, you don't want to go into the detail. But uh, Trevor, Trevor Lyons says, reckons that that plan uh, would, for instance, uh, uh, have five five-year elections. The new intake would elect a third of the new house. Uh, so each lord or senator, as he was going to call it, would sit for fifteen years. Uh, it will be capped to four hundred and fifty. And the aim would be, one aim would be that the senators would be less London-centric. And the electorate, the electorate, and this was the, he, you have to correct this if you think some of it's wrong. Uh, but uh, Trevor's saying that the electorate will be, uh, not us, but the MPs, MEPs, and members of devolved parliaments. And so it goes on. And so he wonders whether, if you can recall this plan, whether you uh, approved of it. Because Steele claimed it would, reduce or eliminate conflict between the two houses and it would uh, uh, reduce sex uh, costs and, and so on and so forth. Did, was that a really significant proposal at the time and have you got any he wants to know. No, uh, you, you are again. You are it. testing me a bit here because we're referring back ten years. David Steele mm. has made various proposals for reform. He's actually made yeah. proposals for bicameralism in Scotland as well as a former presiding officer right. in the Scottish Parliament. Um, David Steele was the first um, was the person who, for years, proposed small reforms in private members' bills. Actually, and it, Lord Brocott effectively took over from him in the annual ritual of proposing these small reforms. So David Steele has proposed small reforms as well as as well as bigger ones at times. He is one of the people who has sort of written pamphlets and things and given speeches occasionally with proposals, but I'm not sure what this particular set of proposals was in 2012. Some of the ideas there are quite familiar from some of the other sorts of proposals that have been swirling around in the Labour White Papers, for example, and in the uh, Clegg Bill. So the idea that, I mean, every time that there has been a proposal to introduce elected members, whether it be the Royal Commission chaired by Lord Wakeham back in 2000, or whether it be any of the Labour sets of proposals or the proposals from Nick Clegg under the coalition government, it's always been the case that the proposal has been that the election should be on a regional basis. Mm -hmm. um, so Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and the English regions. Um, and therefore that you would get a greater sort of territorial diversity among the representatives in the Lords. The London centricness of the Lords is another of the allegations which is thrown at it. I think it is, um, I, I don't deny that there's validity in it, um, but I think it's quite a complicated question because members of the House of Lords are not paid a salary um, and they get very little in terms of allowances. They, they get £300 a day in allowances, but they don't get any staff. And so many of them have to spend their 
allowances on employing staff or on um, maintaining somewhere to stay in London. So there's a very big disincentive actually from living outside London. If you are a member of the House of Lords, it's not very practical to take a seat in the House of Lords if you live a, a long way away from London. So yes, it can be criticized for being London centric, but the system of allowances and the way that people are chosen rather makes it that way. And as I say, all of the proposals for election have been to open it out and make it more geographically representative. And there are probably things that you could do in Canada. You're very keen, Bill, to hear about other other places. Canada is an interesting example for yeah, us. Yeah, I've got a question about that. Go on. The, the Canadian Senate um, is is the only really comparable one around. There are, I think, um, I think there is somewhere around 15 uh, wholly appointed or wholly unelected second chambers around the world. Some of them are in places like the small Caribbean islands. In terms of the places that we would generally compare ourselves with, the big comparator is Canada. It's the only real kind of comparable democracy that has a wholly unelected chamber. It's an appointed chamber, in, obviously influenced historically by the House of Lords. So um, members um, appointed by the Prime Minister, but the Prime Minister has to appoint um, from the provinces of Canada in a representative way. And of course, we could introduce a system like that here. They, they have a requirement, I think, that you, that you own property, that, you have, that maybe even that you have a place of residence in the province that you were appointed to represent. So we could move that way. Um, the other thing that the Canadians have done, which is fascinating, and I haven't really had the opportunity to study it in detail, is that they've moved completely away from party appointments. So we got ahead of them with the establishment of our appointments commission in 2000, which um, chooses crossbench peers, but they're only a minority of members of the Lords. They had no such thing. They had sort of no real, no check, no independent influence in the appointment process at all. They looked to us, copied our appointments commission to an extent, but um, Justin Trudeau has given it control of all the appointments. So there are no party appointments at all in Canada anymore. Gradually, it's turning into an all independent Senate, which is a very interesting experiment. It's effectively a chamber of crossbenchers. Um, and I'd love to know more about how it works. Yes, yeah, so uh, you've anticipated a, a question we got from uh, one of our members, da David, and uh, the only other, you've covered uh, nearly everything he's asked about. Uh, <laughs> his re remarks were that it's uh, uh, that all of these members are non-party, but they're recommended from an, by an independent board, and then the prime minister apparently is obliged to choose from their shortlist. Mm. So he can mm. play favourites but from the list that they provided, um, which would sort of curtail the behaviour of some of our recent uh, prime ministers, I would have thought. Uh, has such an, uh, um, that sounds, I would have thought, to many citizens as a, a good way to go, but uh, uh, is there any way in which you could see that happening in the UK? Well, I think there are, there's a very strong case for strengthening our Appointments Commission. And there are many people who want our Appointments Commission strengthened in various ways. There haven't, there haven't been any sort of particularly prominent uh, proponents of going the complete Canadian route and making them all independent. Um, I mean, I think it is, a, it is an interesting experiment because of, you know, I've, I've written about the crossbenchers. So I've studied the crossbenchers. I've, I have stuff in my books about the crossbenchers. I've written a paper about the crossbenchers. I'm pretty much the only person who studied them. And there are really interesting questions in terms of, you know, yes, they're independent, but to what extent have political ideology? To what extent are there sort of factions within that group that tend to the left and tend to the right? You know, there are independent say, entrepreneurs and business people, and there are independent people from the charity sector. So is there a sort of quasi-party system operating within the crossbenches? My answer to that essentially is no, but I think there are, there are interesting questions of that kind. And I think those questions, I'd love to know the answer to them in the Canadian context, um, yeah, because well, I don't know whether the people yeah. that are appointed by Trudeau are seen as being in some way friendly to Trudeau whilst not officially being party members. I really don't know. The, the, sorts, the sorts of suggestions that have been made for the Appointments Commission here, I mean, of course, we, we 
we have a tradition, although it is fading, I have to say, and I, I rather regret that it's fading, of appointing former party grandees to the House of Lords. So, you know, it used to be that fairly routinely former prime ministers were appointed to the Lords. We don't have any former prime ministers in the Lords at the moment. You know, John Major's not there, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, Theresa May, none of them are there. James Callaghan was there, Margaret Thatcher was there, but, you know, those people are now gone. So I, th I think the sort of great and the good and the grandees of the parties are actually very valuable, can be very valuable in the Lords because they have, you know, decades of experience of policy making, difficult decision making, and they have that distance from politics compared to when they were at the heart of government. You know, people like uh, Theresa May and, uh, and John Major and Gordon Brown, you know, they've got a lot to contribute to political debate. I think it's a shame that they're not in the Lords myself. And that to me would be an argument against all independent appointment. But we could strengthen the Appointments Commission without a doubt. There have been proposals, well, as I alluded to, that there should be regulation, not only of the size of the chamber, but of the balance of appointments, that we should have a formula saying what the share is that should go to the Conservatives or go to Labour based on um, a formula probably based on general election vote shares. Uh, maybe across more than one election. Mm. There are different ways that you could do it, but some kind of rational formula for sharing things out so they don't all go to the governing party and you get these swing one way to the one way and then a swing back the other way, which has this ratchet effect. There have also been suggestions of greater regulation in terms of things like uh, gender balance, maybe even a sort of professional balance, and maybe, as we've just said before, um, territorial balance. So you could set some requirements on the party leaders that they met certain criteria of diversity in their appointments, or taking it to the extreme, you could just take their power away completely and give it all to the Appointments Commission, have the Appointments Commission choosing the party people. That would be controversial um, because it's slightly odd to have people outside the party picking representatives of the party, given that they, when they get in there, they're largely expected to listen to the party whip. So, you know, it's a big complicated question, but we can definitely do more. And sorry, let me say one more thing. Sorry, you're gonna be getting fed up with me. One thing that I didn't mention was the role that the Appointments Commission has um, in regulating the propriety of appointees. Now with all of the, you know, allegations of cash for peerages and all the rest of that, um, the fact that the Appointments Commission scrutinizes the propriety of the Prime Minister's um, nominees is very important and has been very important for the last 20 years. But Boris Johnson is actually the first prime minister to have refused a recommendation of the Appointments Commission on propriety. So we know that former prime ministers, you know, Blair, Cameron, had pe put, put people up to the Appointments Commission that they said, we don't think this is a proper person and we don't think you should appoint them. And they always back down. But Johnson, on one of his appointments, didn't back down. He simply overrode the propriety recommendations of the Appointments Commission, which leads me to think that the Appointments Commission should have the power to impose those recommendations on the Prime Minister. OK, thank, thank, thanks for that. Uh, I mean, one thing that we, we haven't discussed, maybe it's not appropriate, is, is the, the, the question is whether this is an elite uh, that, that maybe the citizens do feel that... Uh, uh, some of these people are experts, but they uh, they don't know how uh, uh, how to get by on the uh, uh, on the minimum wage, and uh, yet uh, we'll have uh, to express views on all of that. Um, I don't know whether that's a subject for for another day because I want to bring in the question of voting because we've talked a lot about appointments and uh, uh, that route for strengthening the Lords. Uh, so uh, Joe Sexton and Ian Duardo, why, why can't we vote? for the upper house. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, Julie's saying, uh, in regard to an elected second chamber, how would the apathy and low turnout in elections uh, allow for the required scrutiny? And I don't know what scrutiny she's got in mind. And maybe one might almost add uh, sort of the, uh, uh, the validity, if you like, of, uh, of those who, uh, who get through on a, uh, on a low turnout vote. Uh, has that been looked at? Uh, because we've seen that in other types of elections, uh, uh, not for the you know not the main 
general elections, uh, poor turnout is often uh, a concern. Uh, has that been explored as a reason for not having uh, a, uh, an elected upper house? Well, there are questions about you know, if you had elections, when, when would you have them? Um, and it might be sensible actually to have them alongside general elections, to have them on the same day, because you do have this problem with what, what political scientists refer to as second order elections. So low turnout and lack of engagement in things like um, local elections, um, the European elections when we used to have those often got a turnout of only about a third. So one option would be to hold elections to the Lords on the same day as a general election. Of course, if you elected two whole chambers at the same time, you really are setting yourself up for conflict uh, because they would see that they had a similar electoral mandate. But generally those proposals, again, going back to those proposals through the Labour years, which were essentially pretty identical in the end to the proposals that the coalition government, or I, I refer to them as the Clegg reforms because the Conservatives were never really signed up to them. Um, the, the, those proposals, um, which I thought was, I thought were basically sensible, and you can take this all the way back to the Wakeham Commission, the proposal was that only a third of the members would be elected at any election. So you don't have the, the clash of mandates of two houses elected on the same day what you have is a gradual renewal of the members in the second chamber. So a third are elected at one general election, and then you know, four or five years later, another third are elected, and then four or five years later, another third are elected, and then the first lot go and are refreshed. So they would serve longer terms of 12 to 15 years, and they would never all have a fresh mandate. And that would also give you a more stable party balance. So you wouldn't have a sort of wild swing from one party to the other. Over time, they would kind of level out. Um, and I think there's a lot of merit in, in those proposals. I think they were quite carefully thought through. But then as soon as you propose something like that, um, you get people saying, well, hang on, 15 years, that's an awfully long time. Is that really legitimate? Um, and basically any set of proposals that you can come up with for a reformed composition, people can immediately start picking holes in. It goes back to that point on my slide about how second chambers are by their very nature controversial. If you make them the same as the first chamber, they're brought into question. If you make them different to the first chamber, people say, well, hang on, 15 years, shouldn't it be five like the House of Commons? Um, so it's very, very difficult to get it right. And also, you know, clearly there, are, there have been sensible proposals, in my view, to balance the elected members with appointed members. So whether you make it 50-50, as was proposed in 2007, or whether you make it 80-20 in one direction or the other, you, can, you'll, you will maintain those experts, those independent people, and you'll also sort of temper the claims to democratic legitimacy by the elected people, so you get a kind of compromise. But actually, people don't much like compromise. This, this is why it's so difficult to achieve. I don't want to get into sort of deep water, but uh, I've just noticed that Ian Brown has uh, uh, raised a, a, a comment and a question about the uh, the Irish uh, second house. Is it that? How do I mm. pronounce it correctly? The Shannad, is it? Uh, the Shannad, I think. Shannad, thank you. The Shannad. <laughs> uh, forgive me. Uh, so he's saying that there's a, uh, he believes there's a set number of senators who have voted in for a term. And this is related to specific constituencies like universities, the equivalent of royal societies, legal societies and political parties to get a greater degree of expertise into the legislative process. So as he's wondering whether that's relevant to us, I mean, maybe the answer is that, well, we're already there because we've got a, mm. a lot of cross benches. Are, are the Irish catching up with us or is there something for us to learn from them, do you think? Uh, this, this, that, I'm really, I'm really grateful to Ian for raising that. That's a, that is a terrific example, and it touches on something that actually, when we were talking about religion earlier on, in terms of how do you divide up uh, between different groups, how do you decide how many seats each of them gets? You get those kind of conundrums in the Irish system as well. So yes, the Irish system is, um, I've, I've referred to it, various people refer to it as a vocational system. So you have these kind of vocational constituencies where some people represent education, some people represent the arts, some people represent trade unions, this kind of thing. Um, 
back um, at the beginning of the formation of the Irish state, they worked out how there should be a share between these groupings. And that hasn't been, I don't think has been changed since. It's written into the constitution. It looks like a really nice idea, but actually what happens is that the electorate for the, so you, you've got these constituencies or sort of constituencies of the mind, you might say, vocational constituencies, but the electorate are councillors and members of the lower house. And so the candidates who run in those elections are almost invariably representatives of the parties um, who just seek nomination from the kind of educational bodies and the arts bodies and so on. And they are party elections. So there are things in the Irish system that are really quite attractive, but in the implementation, you wouldn't implement it that way. <laughs> so you could think about vocational constituencies and there have been various proposals for reform in Ireland and a few here as well to suggest that you come up with these kind of vocational categories. But there is a question as to who the electorate should be, which the Irish have answered in a rather peculiar way. And there's also the question about how many should be in edu how many should be education and how many should be health and how many should be the arts and these are really imponderable questions kind of you know good luck answering them this is how you end up going round and round in circles and never reaching a resolution uh, just a quick word we're not here to talk about cost uh, but um, have you formed a view on uh, 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 on this they as Margaret Teasdale says, there are often criticisms in the press about the cost of the upper chamber. Uh, and she asks, what is the cost? You might, your team might have worked it out and mm -hmm. seen whether it's increasing dramatically or told her you can tell us what it is as a percentage of GDP and all that stuff. <laughs> uh, they used to tell us the EU was very, very inexpensive for our citizens. Uh, what do you want to say about the cost of the House of Lords, let's say compared with uh, uh, other chambers around the world. Any thoughts on that? Mm. Well, I, when you mentioned your uh, previous complacent speaker on this subject, I think you said that he or she, I'm, I'm guessing who it, who it was, uh, that he or she um, uh, said that we were getting a second chamber on the cheap. And, and I think that's true, actually. I think that we get tremendously good value out of the House of Lords. Now, it is controversial because of the allowances and because people who turn up get a daily allowance. Um, but the staffing costs are very low because members of the House of Lords, it's, it's much, it costs, if you'd given me pre-warning of the system, I would have looked in my book. Uh, and of course, that's a good opportunity to advertise my book. Or I think you can probably find the answer on the parliamentary website, to be honest. It costs a fraction of what the House of Commons does because the members do not get a salary and the members also do not get any staff, whereas members of the House of Commons get a salary of, I think it's about 80,000 pounds or something, um, and they get about five staff. So that's a big cost. Now the House of Lords has the same backroom facilities. So it's got the clerks it, who look after the committees and run the business uh, in the chamber. It's got obviously the people who maintain the building. It's got the researchers who work in the library. But the cost of the members is very, very low. And I, I, I haven't got the comparative figures, but I think it would be very low compared to, uh, with the exception perhaps of some of those small Caribbean islands, probably any of the comparable places that I've mentioned, you know, Australia, Canada, South Africa, France, Germany. Well, Germany, exception actually, because they're salaried by they're, they're members of the state governments, and so they're paid by the state governments. But any of those other places in Europe uh, and in the big Commonwealth countries, I think the cost would be much higher. Okay. It's not uh, to say that all the money is absolutely spent in the right way. You know, there, there are always bad apples, and I think there probably are people who claim allowances who arguably shouldn't be claiming those allowances. But I think in general, there are the people who keep the place going from day to day, the members who keep the place going from day to day, Many of them work, you know, round the clock with very little research support, barely any secretarial support at all. Unlike members of the Commons, you know, they're struggling to keep on top of their own emails. Um, we do get good value from them on the whole. Could you just, the, the, the other side of that particular coin, and we'll have to be brief because we're, we're running out of time. And I've got one question uh, to round things off, but let's just deal with it. I mean, there's, one of the questions is about um, whether they turn up. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, so Nick, uh, Nick um, Glanville is wondering uh, whether a figure's published showing the average attendance of the Lords. Uh, you could probably tell us uh, about, about, about that. Uh, but it also raises the question, doesn't it? So, well, you could have a you could have a big House of Lords if you took the view, well, you want lots of talent, uh, but you don't mind if uh, Joe Bloggs is a famous cricketer and only turns up uh, to discuss uh, topics that are close to his heart or in his area of knowledge. And therefore, you'd want more people to get mm. more expertise, but they turn up turn up less often. Yet we seem to have this core of people who are there working their way through all of the legislation. I've not seen that very thoroughly discussed anywhere. And I think Nick would be interested in that, as well as to know whether there are any uh, figures published as to how often they turn up. Could you help? Yes, I, I think that the figures on average daily allowance you would find somewhere on the Lord's website in annual reports. The last time I looked, um, the average the average daily attendance was something like sort of 350 or 400. So Nick is completely right. They're not full time. Um, the way that it sort of shakes out is there is a core of members who attend nearly every day. And then, as you say, yes, there are some members who dip in and out much less frequently, who maybe attend only occasionally when there's a topic of interest to them. Or, or, you know, what falls within their expertise. And you could say that is completely legitimate. So this is another of those kind of conundrums. If you made it elected, people would be full time. Um, some people say you shouldn't complain about the size of it at 800, because actually, if they're only turning up now and then, and, you know, the average daily atten attendance is 350, then that's fine. So again, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's a very complicated question. The cross benchers tend to dip in more, uh, attend and vote less, because they are the ones who, uh, you know, they don't have any obligation to a political party to arrive, to attend. They don't have any whip. They're not told how to vote. Um, and so they tend to arrive, you know, when they've got things to contribute. Um, and therefore, their rate of attendance would be lower. Sometimes they get criticized for that. So, you know, there's a degree to which um, you can't win. <laughs> Um, you attend too much, you get attacked. Uh, you attend not enough, you get attacked. And I suppose I can say, well, it's a second chamber, it's going to get attacked. Um, the place is very far from perfect. I do not want to appear like an apologist for the place the way it is. But I think we've got to be realistic that it has some good qualities that we might like to keep. And what we need to do is deal with the problems. I'm going to finish off with a, a question. I hope you don't think that it's intended as a, uh, a sort of a uh, to trip you up, but inevitably uh, it might. <laughs> some of the but some of the members are interested in your views, and so uh, any so this comes in two parts really. Uh, one is, do you see any legitimate proposals for actual reform being put forward in the near future? And that's from any source. And the other side of that question is, if you could choose the format of the House of Lords. What would that be and what incremental steps uh, do you think would get us there? Oh, that's a killer question. For killer me, question. Isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> oh, this one. I, I'm pessimistic about uh, proposals, as, as you will have got the impression, but pessimistic about realistic proposals coming forward, because I think that the um, the, 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 the politicians tend to get trapped between this desire to look like they are being radical and the reality of achieving reform and the threat sometimes that reform can be to them in government. That if you do a radical reform that makes the place far more legitimate, you're going to make your life more difficult as a government. And furthermore, your own backbenchers sitting behind you are going to be concerned that the place is going to start getting in the way of them getting what they want and they're probably going to oppose your reform. So it is very, very difficult. I think that some of these sets of proposals which have come forward, the ones which involve long terms of office, uh, people elected in parts, um, some appointed members to maintain the independent element, I think they are actually a decent compromise. But I'm not sure they're ever going to be able to be put into effect for all of the reasons that I've mentioned. So I came along to this debate. I can give you a very precise example. My first book on Lord's Reform um, was published in 2000, a disgraceful 22 years ago. And I studied um, 
in, in detail seven second chambers around the world, including some of the ones I've mentioned, including Ireland, Canada, France, Germany, um, in order to try and work out what I thought was the best model. Um, and I proposed something actually quite similar to what came up in those subsequent proposals, kind of informed by the Australian system where um, they're elected in parts um, on a regional basis, but with some appointed people like they have in Ireland. Um, so that was my model. And I thought that nothing short of that was really going to make the House of Lords a powerful and rooted chamber. But that was published just when the 1999 reform had come in. I didn't expect that reform to have very much effect. And actually, my subsequent work went on to analyze the effect that the 1999 reform had, the removal of the hereditary appears had, and it was transformative. Nobody, including myself, who'd done this comparative study, had really predicted the, 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 the I'm losing my words here, um, the size of the impact of that reform, that by removing hereditary peers who were indefensible and having a large grouping of conservatives who you might have thought were going to be making the Labour government's life difficult, you actually suddenly created this more vibrant and confident upper house that challenged the government much more and was much more effective because it was more party balanced as well as seen as less kind of outrageously illegitimate than before. And that has made me um, a convert to incremental reform for two reasons. One, because I, I've learned that large scale reform just is virtually impossible. And two, because small scale reform really can make a difference and it can also have unintended consequences. So there are some arguments to say, do it bit by bit, because if you do it all at once, you don't really know where you're going to end up. But if you do it bit by bit, which is what we've done for over 100 years now, you can monitor the effects of each little change. And therefore, I want and I've argued for and I've written reports on this, et cetera, et cetera. And I worked as a specialist advisor for the Lord Speaker's Committee on the size of the House. I maybe should have declared that interest. I think we need to get a grip on prime ministerial appointments. We need a cap on the size of the House. And we need to give the Appointments Commission at least a bit more power over who the prime minister can put in and require a kind of formula, some kind of proportionality formula to make sure the seats are shared out fairly. Let's do that. Let's see how that works. And then we can do the next step. And then we can do the next step. And then we can do the next step. We can move from appointment to election. Let's get there step by step. But let's do something. Because otherwise the place is losing credibility, it's losing effectiveness, and our parliament and our politics are suffering from the fact that nothing is happening and the government itself is a roadblock on reform and even you know, undermining deliberately the legitimacy of the place, which makes its life easier as a government, but it doesn't make for better policy and better scrutiny. So, so I think I haven't said anything that would surprise anyone. I'd said all that already, really, but that is my view. No, but you, you have uh, very candidly and very directly answered that uh, final uh, uh, difficult question. And you've uh, made it very clear uh, what your views are. Uh, and that concludes what's been a sort of really a sort of riveting evening on uh, what could be a, a dry subject. I think you've really brought it to life, uh, Meg. And thank you on behalf of everyone watching to for making it. Thank you. Thank you for your patience with uh, my lengthy answers. <laughs> no, no. Uh, we like thought and depth. Uh, we don't like triviality. We can get the triviality in the papers. And that's <laughs> why we uh, we want to meet you. And so it's been a wonderful evening. So on behalf of everyone, thank you so much. And thank you for finding the time to be at Keel World Affairs tonight. Thank uh, you. So, uh, good night, everybody. And it's I think it's good night from Meg too. Good night. <laughs>